Okay, we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. We're going to be there in just a moment if you want to keep your marker there in John, chapter 8. Before we do uh, get into that, keep a marker there and turn back with me to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22. Every once in a while, before we start a section of the Gospels, we'll go back and, and just look briefly at some of the statements in the Old Testament that would have been very, very familiar to these people, the original audience of John's Gospel and and Jesus' teaching. As you're turning back there, I want you to think about the miracles that we've run across so far. Beginning in January, we started in the Gospels, uh, walking through a harmony of those to really try and just saturate the year with the teachings and the life of Jesus. We're going to run across some incredible words of Jesus today in the Gospel of John chapter 8. But this is not where it began. Right? These words have a context. And one of the great contexts of these words are the miracles that Jesus has done. In our timeline that that we give you at the beginning of every quarter, uh, I encourage you maybe to, to make a note or to highlight every time we ran across a miracle. That makes it easy to run back across and see what all has gone on. We think about His first miracle at the wedding in Cana, turning water to wine. Healing an official son. A man with an unclean spirit healed in the synagogue. Peter's mother-in-law healed. That, that evening, a great multitude outside of that house was healed. There was a miraculous catch of fish. There was a leper, a paralytic, an invalid man here in Jerusalem healed at the pool of Bethesda. A withered hand of a man healed on the Sabbath day. A great multitude of people in Galilee a centurion servant in Capernaum, raising the son of a widow in name from the dead, a demon-oppressed man healed, calming of the Sea of Galilee, many demons cast out of a violent man, an ill woman healed by touching Jesus' garment, Jairus' daughter brought back to life, a second resurrection from the dead. Healing two blind men, another demon-oppressed man, feeding 5,000, walking on the Sea of Galilee, causing Peter also to walk, healing many in Gennesaret, healing the daughter of a Canaanite woman, making a deaf man to hear, healing many on a mountain beside the sea, feeding 4,000, a blind man in Bethesda, the transfiguration on the exceedingly high mountain, an unclean spirit being cast out of a boy. Most recently, in our chronological order, Jesus paying the temple tax with a coin out of the mouth of a fish. Okay, There have been some absolutely incredible things. And we don't want to lose sight of how incredible those are in the midst of hearing about so many of them or hearing about them so often, some of us have heard some of those stories since we were uh, just little kids. I want you to think about literally the dozens of miracles that we've run across already. And that is our context in John chapter 8 that we're going to run across in just a moment. Two references from Deuteronomy that we want to read before we get back to John chapter 8. First of all, Deuteronomy chapter 22 and the 22nd verse of the chapter. If you've got your Bibles, turn back there to the old law of Moses. We're going to have a very, very confrontational interaction between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees in John 8. Men who knew and who could recite passages like Deuteronomy 22.22. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. You've got adultery, and both of those adulterous people shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. Okay? A, A principle that these people knew we're familiar with back in Deuteronomy chapter 13 finally one other one before we go back to the gospel of John chapter 8 Deuteronomy chapter 13 when it came to capital punishment cases anything that was really serious how many witnesses did there need to be 
Two witnesses, right? Two witnesses to whatever transgression had happened. And what was the importance of having witnesses? Why do that? Why did God want to make sure this infant nation had that kind of a system in place before blood was shed or before there was harsh, harsh punishment for sin? Why two witnesses? Jurisprudence questions early on Sunday morning maybe are not the way to start out, but go ahead, Dave. Just to to, uh, avoid the situation where it's one person's word against Okay. Not he said, she said, to protect the innocent, obviously, as a way to get justice, but also to protect the weak and, and the innocent, to make sure that truth and righteousness and justice prevailed, but also to, rec- or to, to reinforce the idea of accountability. Back in Deuteronomy 13, we, we've got one principle, okay? And, and we're not, we're not going to get lost in all of the details. It's a principle that we see over and over and over again. The scenario is, if you've got someone even who's very close to you, who's trying to lead you away from God, into idolatry or trying to lead you away from uh, the the, the principles, the oracles, the commandments of God. You look at verse 9. You shall kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death and afterward the hand of all the people. Okay, some basic principles here. First of all, in cases of adultery, man and woman both are guilty. Both are to be severely punished. We've got witnesses that need to be present. But if you are one of those witnesses and these things have been verified, who's supposed to cast the first stone? It's the witnesses, right? The people who are there, the people who know. And even if it is someone who is very, very close to you, even a son or a daughter or a mother or father, brother or sister, whomever it is, the people will follow the witnesses. Right? Basic, basic, basic law of Moses principles. Now, let's go back to John chapter 8 with that as our context. We can't cover all 59 verses of this chapter. We're going to zero in, first of all, on the first paragraph and then look at some of the incredible statements of Jesus that come after that. Our setting is Jerusalem. We were there with Jesus. Last week He has come down from Galilee. This is about six months before He is going to be crucified. The last time that He will leave Jerusalem of His own accord, or at least as as, as far as uh, it appeared was His own accord. John chapter 8 and and verse 1 tells us that Jesus left Jerusalem after the setting of John 7. He comes over to the Mount of Olives. We've got the Kidron Valley between the old city of David, the old city of Jerusalem, that Kidron Valley, and then this picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. Okay, This is what it looks like today. This is what it would have looked like 2,000 years ago. The old temple complex and the Mount of Olives somewhere over here with the Kidron Valley running between. Early in the morning, John chapter 8 and verse 2, He came to the temple. All the people came to Him and He sat down and taught them. Why are all the people coming? Because of these amazing miracles that He's been able to do. And because of His great teachings that have been unable to be refuted. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. It's early in the morning. Maybe in the early morning hours, she's caught in the very act. She has spent the night with a man with whom she has no right to be. The scribes and the Pharisees drag her into the temple complex, place her right in the midst of the people, and they say to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Now, why are they doing this? If you've read the next verse or two, you know why. Okay, John tells us, This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Is it? Do, do we have reason to believe that the scribes and Pharisees are imminently concerned with justice, 
with purging the evil from the people, to borrow the language of Deuteronomy 22. Is that what this is about? Why do you shake your head no? Maybe a couple indications. Phil? Where's the man, first of all? Now, maybe... You know, we'll talk benefit of the doubt here. You know, maybe he saw people coming and he took off and, and he wasn't identified. Maybe that's it. But probably not just based on the language that they use, right? Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, uh, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. No mention of the man, right? And so John tells us they're trying to test him. What's the test here? Why is this, at least in their minds, you, you've heard this phrase, horns of a dilemma, where either way you go, you're going to get caught by a horn and, and, and stabbed by one of those horns. Why in their mind is this a great way to test Jesus? Any ideas as to why? This would be such a serious test. Go ahead. When they try, they're trying to find fault with him because they want to try to kill him. Okay. They want a reason for it. Okay. They want him eliminated. No doubt about it. And there are two horns of this dilemma. Casey? Where are your witnesses? Okay. Where are witnesses, first of all? Okay. Um, and we got, we got two horns here. Either he's going to alienate himself from the, the scholars of the law, or he's going to get in trouble with Rome. How in the world would he get in trouble with Rome? Any ideas? He would try to supersede their authority. Okay. As far as Rome was concerned, who had the right to put people to death? Just the Romans, right? This is occupied territory. Jews are living under the thumb of Rome 2,000 years ago. And so we got a lot of things swirling around here, but that's one of the big dilemmas. Okay, what do you do, Jesus? Here's a woman caught in the very act of adultery, and the law says she ought to be killed. Now, in their minds, if he says, okay, go ahead and, and, and stone her, and they do that, well, what's going to happen right over there at that Antonia fortress that we were talking about last week, where all the Roman soldiers are? It's not going to take long before it gets around the city. There's a woman who's been stoned to death. And is Rome going to have anything to say about that? You better believe they're going to have something to say about that, right? They view any sort of insurrection, any, any sort of... of crowd mob mentality like that as a possibility for revolt. There have been many efforts of, of revolt before Jesus comes along and many that come after. Eventually it gets so bad 40 years later that they level the city to the ground, right? And so if they hear that a woman has been stoned, who are they going to come look for? Probably the Pharisees and the scribes, right? And what are the Pharisees and scribes going to say? Going back to what Grace said, right? Jesus of Nazareth told us to do this. He said we could. And what are the Romans going to do? They're going to come looking for Him. Okay, that's one horn of dilemma. The other one is, well, if He says, no big deal, let her go, now we've got Him on a violation of the law. Okay, over and over and over again, we see the Pharisees and scribes trying to do this. This is not the first time. It's certainly not the last before the conclusions of the Gospels. We come up with the most difficult situations, the most difficult questions, and we're going to test him. And we think we have found situations where it's going to be a lose-lose situation. Later on, it's going to be, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Right? Because you go one way and you get the Romans mad, you go the other way and you get the Jews mad. And Jesus will, will note how he, how he gets out of that. Now, Casey brought up a, a good point. First of all, number one, where are the witnesses? Okay, right now we've got the woman, we've got the Pharisees who are looking down on her. The question is, what do you say? And the latter part of verse 6, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger 
on the ground. have no idea what he wrote. This is the one instance in all of the Gospels that we have record of him writing something. But he stoops down and he writes with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, did you hear us? You know, what do you think? Give us an answer. He stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Now we'll talk about his interaction with her in just a moment. Why is what Jesus said so incredible? What is it about this one statement? You know, here are the scribes and the Pharisees and they think, okay, this is it. The unanswerable question. You give an answer and you're caught one way or another. And he doesn't preach a sermon. He doesn't give us a paragraph. It's one statement. And upon hearing that one statement, they drop their stones and walk away. So what is it about the statement? Zippy, go ahead. Basically what he ended up doing was the statement caused the people to reflect on themselves exactly the, the situation. And in doing so, he took away the assumption that the Pharisees had. See, they were playing on the assumption that these people were going to stone her. That was a given. They, they just knew, well, this is going to happen. Yeah. Well, he took that away. That was the one part that they had played that didn't happen. Okay. Hey, their whole car is gone. So basically, without the people, they had no operative that was not going to happen. So no stoning, no happening. They're done. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. Jesus here is using this opportunity to show there's going to be a shift from the old law to the new law. That's why he's here. Okay. And as Paul summed it up perfectly later, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Okay. One of the great principles of the New Testament that these scribes and Pharisees could not see, right? There, there are echoes, obviously, where, where Jesus doesn't just throw the whole law out with, with other disregard. I mean, we, we've seen that, and I think both Casey and Zippy have brought up good points. You know, what made being a false witness so serious you committed two sins, right? I mean, going back to Deuteronomy 22 and Deuteronomy 13, what, what is the weight? If you're a false witness, not only are you guilty of lying, but you be a witness in accordance with the old law of Moses, and what else are you going to be guilty of in, a, in addition to lying? Murder, right? Lying and murder. That's what makes being a false witness so very serious under this old system. And so we've got, it, like Dave said, we're, it's almost like we're right here in the middle where two great tectonic plates are, are butting up against each other. And we're right in the middle, the old and, and the new. And Jesus doesn't just disregard the old. He uses the old to shame these people who are trying to test Him, right? Where are the witnesses? You, you know, if one of you is the witness and you're innocent in this matter, you go ahead and get it started. What does Jesus do? You know, they're trying to get the, the responsibility on Him. Jesus wasn't there. He, he wasn't one of the witnesses. And so if one of you as an innocent witness is the one who can lead this charge, you go ahead and do it puts the responsibility back on them. Where if they follow through with it, not only do they appear to be very self-righteous and ruthless, but the responsibility as far as Rome is concerned is theirs. But there's also New Testament echoes as well, right? A principle that is going to come through loud and clear, especially once the whole story has been told. Everybody's guilty of sin, right? Something that these scribes and Pharisees just could not see. Something that Saul of Tarsus as a Pharisee eventually had to see. And when he saw it, it shook everything about his life to the very core. Okay? The oldest ones... Why does it start, do you think, with the oldest ones? 
Jesus says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. So why is it the oldest ones who walk away first? Eric? Well, they're the ones that have been around a long okay. time. And yeah. They actually have a little bit more experience. They have more experience, good and bad experience, right? right? They've been around and they know I'm not completely innocent. And so one by one, they start dropping the stones. Jesus knows why these people came. He knows what's in their hearts. He's known all along, right? They eventually walk away. And in John chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 10, Jesus stands up and He says to this woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now, what do we make of that last statement? Is Jesus saying adultery is not that big of a deal? I don't condemn you. Just go right back to that adulterous relationship. What, what do we make of neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Nancy, it's good to have you back, Nancy. It's like your lesson last week when you talk about the path. That when you're going on that path, you need to change direction. It doesn't make a difference who you are. Money you have or how you are or nothing. Yeah. Speaks to the very essence of repentance, right? Repentance does not mean I've blown everything and it's too late and God just wants me to recognize that before He snuffs me out. No, repentance is, is culminated, it is the fruit of godly sorrow, right? That, that I recognize I am deserving of death. This woman recognized that, right? I deserve death. And Jesus says, it's not too late, but you've got to repent. You've got to stop the sin. Adultery was sinful before and after her interaction with Jesus, right? That's why you go and you sin no more. It's not too late to get your life straightened out. It's not too late to get back on the right path. God can save you just like He can save the Pharisees and the scribes and Peter and James and John and, and everyone involved here. But the sin has got to stop. Eric, go ahead. Okay. It's by grace. Okay. You know, like, he was great. The crowd dropped their stones. He was like, I don't hold anything against you. Now, because of this, you should sin no more. You know, like, we, you, you're, you're given a second chance. Yeah. Use it wisely. It is a living picture. If you turn a f few pages earlier to John 3, verse 17, it is a living representation of his words on a couple of different occasions. John 3, 17 is one instance. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. God did not send His Son to, to come a, a, and destroy the world that deserved it because of sin. That's not why the Son was here, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Or John chapter 8. You turn back to where we were. John chapter 8 and verse 15 Jesus says, you judge, Pharisees and scribes, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Why was Jesus here? In the language of Luke 19.10, He came to seek and to save that which was lost, right? Now, if we rejoice in that and put a period and, and don't ever read beyond that, we're not getting the whole story, right? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. But over on this side of the podium is the rest of the story, right? Jesus is going to come again. And when He comes, in what way is He coming? As judge, right? Okay, so that's the whole story. But here, obviously, is a living embodiment of why He came. To seek and to save that which was lost. Those people like this woman. Now, like I said, we don't have the time, obviously, to cover all of the statements in this chapter, but, but I want you to notice some of the incredible statements. John 8 and verse 12, immediately after this, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I 
am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Was this woman in darkness? Sure she was. What did she need to do? Stop the sin, follow me. The ironic thing is, the scribes and the Pharisees were also in darkness. But it is a living embodiment of what Jesus said, that some of the lowliest of the low have eyes to see. And some of the highest of the high do not. And so, Pharisees and scribes, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going to raise up in judgment against you on the last day because they responded to John the Baptist and they responded to me when you did not. I'm the light of the world for everyone. But more is involved than just seeing the light, right? It's recognizing I'm in darkness and I've got to follow that light. Look down at verse 21. Again, He said to them, I am going away and you will seek Me and you will die in your sin. Who's He talking to? He's not talking to this woman anymore. Just, just her. right? He's talking to the crowd that's there. Including the Pharisees and the scribes. Where I am going, you cannot come. What in the world is he talking about? You look down at verse 24. I told you that would, you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Verse 28. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. You will know that I am He. Who, wh who is this He that Jesus keeps saying He is? Christ. Messiah, the Christ. Ultimately, the Son of God. Right In our sermon this morning, we're going to look at seven statements from John's Gospel where Jesus said, I am, and seven different answers. Okay, All of them encompassed in this kind of thing. I'm the one you've been looking for. I'm the deliverer. I'm the one sent from God. And He's telling these people they're going to kill Him and then they're going to be looking for Him. And he's going to be gone, and where he is, they will not be able to follow. Verse 31, he said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What does it mean to abide in his word? We, we reference verses 31 and 32 very frequently. What, what does that mean? To abide in the Word. Well, first of all, it means to really believe it and okay. then apply it to your life. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cheryl? I was going to say live it. Live it, David? Uh, remain in it. Uh, okay. Continue living in it. Okay. Jesus has delivered the revelation of God. One of the great points of this eighth chapter is... What I'm saying to you is not of my own authority. I didn't come up with this on my own. I, I, I'm not, you know, one of the things they bring up, we were talking about witnesses. They're saying, well, you're the only witness to what you're saying. And Jesus says, no, there are two. The two witnesses are me and whom? My Father who is in heaven, right? And the things that I'm telling you are from Him. I didn't just wander in here from the foothills of Galilee on my own authority. I have come down from heaven and the things I'm telling you are the very words of God. And you must hear those and you must believe those and you must abide in those. You know what that means? I mean, practically speaking, that has enormous ramifications for you and I as well. It is not as if, okay, on Sunday I pay attention to the words of Jesus and then Monday through Saturday I set those aside and I abide in real life. No, there are the words of Jesus and I'm going to feed every aspect of my existence through the filter of those words. And if they fit 
and they harmonize, I'm going to abide in them. And if they don't fit, my actions don't harmonize, I'm going to set those aside and follow Jesus. Richard, go ahead. How much of that truth can we say doesn't say it was something I want to model? How much of the truth of God? Good question. Why don't you answer your own question? There there aren't any hands raised. (laughs) All of that truth, right? There's no excess. Yeah. I mean, he says in in, uh, verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. What truth? The truth that we have right in front of us, right? The truth at this point that that had... uh, uh, it, It started, obviously in Genesis and now we're seeing the fulfillment of so much and and beholding right before our very eyes the hinge uh, like someone had said earlier the the the, what everything is going to hang on now looking forward and and looking back all hangs on the truth that Jesus was delivering through God and, and the truth that ultimately His apostles would be guided in, according to John 17, by, by the Spirit of God. Did you have anything to add to that? No. There's so many people who say, well, that's not important. So we'll... Yeah. Yeah, just pick and choose. We feel fine to understand that the thing we think is not important. We may have later said, I ain't standing to see the moon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's obviously something that's, that's lost on, on these Pharisees and scribes. Look at verse 42, where Jesus absolutely draws the line in the sand. If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And if they wanted to kill Him before then, they most certainly want to kill Him now. Right? It is growing more and more and more clear that Jesus is a dividing line. You are either with Him or against Him. Okay, We'll reference this last paragraph in our sermon. I appreciate you being here. I would encourage you to prepare for uh, John chapter 9 and, and the early verses of John chapter 10. If you do not have material, please feel free to grab those. They're on the visitor's table in the foyer here on the front pew. We will be in week number 30 next Sunday morning. Thank you.